Listen to the radio program and answer questions 1 to 4. Now, after that old favourite from the cores, entitled I Never Loved You Anyway, we have Dr Claire Greenhill to talk to us today about stress in the workplace. Is it getting worse, Dr Greenhill? I'm not sure whether it's getting worse or just that more people are talking about it. Certainly lots more people are complaining about it. I've just completed a study of 5,000 workers from 20 different countries, and I've taken a multicultural approach to the subject. And what have you found? that, broadly speaking, the causes of stress are similar the world over. For example, Ramon from Mexico City says that society measures people by individual success. But, he says, increasingly, work is organized in teams. This means there's a conflict between personal goals and the need to cooperate with one's colleagues. He finds this an acute source of stress, actually. Then there's Kikuko from Osaka, Japan, who says she's under a lot of stress because the company she's worked for for 30 years is in difficulties. She says it's because her bosses made a number of bad decisions, but really what worries her most is that she might lose her job. You know, she's in her 50s, and at that age it's not easy to find another one. She says that she also feels overworked, and well, that's getting her stressed out too. Well, then there's Boris from Odessa in the Ukraine. He puts overwork at the top of his list of stressors, then there are other factors. Both he and his wife have full-time jobs, so that when they get home, they don't get to relax much either. I guess that's a problem most of us can relate to. <laughs> we always hear about computers, email and cell phones as things which get people tearing their hair out. Is this true? Mm, in many cases, yes. But not as much as you might think. Only 15% of respondents give this as the main cause. Etienne from Quebec, Canada is one. Though he also mentions change and the feeling of being a victim of circumstances beyond his control. Other people talk about the amount of work which comes with continual change as being more stressing than new technologies themselves. People feel they lack stability in their working life. But we must remember that in many places it's really lack of new technology that puts people under most pressure. Take Nagwa from Sohag in Egypt, for example. She says that for her, the main source of stress was working in noisy, hot, unventilated conditions, day in, day out, and with no end in sight. So it seems we can't win either way. Before the radio program continues, look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to the next part of the programme and answer questions 5 to 10. So what can we as individuals do to make things easier for ourselves? Well, I've talked to a number of specialists about this, doctors and psychologists, and here are a few suggestions for reducing stress without you having to change your job. First, vary your diet. Fish, pasta, vegetables, fruit and so on. Try not to live off sandwiches and fast food. A balanced diet, in other words. Also, we tend to drink too much coffee. Caffeine, the drug in coffee, gets us more nervous. So if you want to feel less stressed, drink less coffee. It's tough at first, but you'll notice the difference within just a few days. Finally, take regular exercise. It's a great way of relaxing, and of course it makes you more healthy, too. For particular causes of stress, there are various things you can do. If your problem is that you think you've got too much work on your plate, what you probably need to do is manage time better. You have to learn to deal with the things which are really vital. Don't waste time on trivialities. There are courses to help you with this. If you are worried about unemployment, make plans so that if it happens, you are ready for it. Do things like set money aside and update your CV so it's attractive to new employers. As for new technologies, do training courses so that you feel at home with them and so that you don't feel frightened of them. So in the end, 
the best way to deal with stress is for you to take control of your life and not allow yourself to be a victim of circumstances. Thank you, Dr. Claire Greenhill, on fighting stress. And just when you thought you could relax, here's Dolly Parton working nine to five. Now turn to section two. Section two. You'll hear a talk by a security worker from Sydney Airport who is introducing the day-to-day -day operations of the Australian Quarantine Service. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hi everyone and welcome to Sydney Airport. Today I'll be giving you the inside information on the day-to-day -day operations of the Australian Quarantine Service here. We hope to provide you with a better understanding of why such heavy security regulations are necessary by educating you on how we operate and why we do the things we do. We're not here to try to persuade you to fly through Sydney Airport, though we hope you'll find your experience relatively stress-free and comfortable. First things first, our personnel. Can anyone guess how many people work at Sydney Airport? We have 200 alone working in Terminal 2, so can you guess how many in the whole airport? I heard someone say 360. That's getting closer. What? Did someone say 2,000? That's way too high. Sydney Airport actually employs 440 people. A lot, right? And about half of those employees work in security-related matters. Moving on to our not-so-human employees, let's come and see our favourite pooch, Milton. Milton is our best drug-sniffing dog on the force. He's friendly to most people. You can even come pet him at the end of our tour. Burnouts, beware though, he'll find everything. Notice that even though there are so many of us around him, Milton stays quite calm. This is the precise reason he was chosen for the job. Dogs that are chosen are not predisposed to sniff out different narcotics. That's something we teach them already. So here's a part of the airport most people never notice, the cargo transport terminal. This is where packages are shipped to and from. Normally, we ship around 4,400 packages per month. In this airport alone, over 52,000 packages were shipped in and out over the past year. We ship to and from 170 different countries. Not bad, eh? Probably it will go up to over 72,000 packages this year. And despite over 100 flights in and out of here daily, the number of lost or delayed packages is impressively low. If you send your package through here, rest assured, we'll get it where it's going. Let's move on to the area most of us are familiar with, the passenger terminals. In order to be allowed into this area, you must pass through security with your ticket and, if you're travelling internationally, your passport. If you're travelling domestically, you just need a legal form of ID. If you don't have those, you will not be allowed to pass through security and board your flight. During the security scan, your carry-on items will be checked for dangerous items such as weapons, sharp objects and liquids that exceed our specified limit. If you attempt to pass any of the prohibited items on this list posted at the entrance, you are still allowed to board the plane, but you'll be given a warning and your item will be confiscated. Don't worry, we will not arrest you for having too much shampoo in your bag or anything like that. We also search your carry-ons and parcels for any perishable items. We prohibit the transportation of local vegetation and prohibit parcels containing any insects in them. You may or may not have learnt about this in biology class, but when some plants are introduced to a new environment, they spread wildly and wipe out the current species around it. It is important to control the introduction of new plants into an ecosystem, so we must prohibit the transport of any fertile seeds. 
So what happens to parcels containing possibly suspicious items? It's of course something we do not take lightly here. If an object passes through the scanner that appears suspicious in any way, it is separated out for manual search by a member of our trained security personnel. If an illegal plant or simple sharp object like a pocket knife is found, it is simply disposed of in our biohazard waste containers, and the package itself is returned to the sender or passenger if it is for a passenger flight. More serious weapons are reported to higher authorities for investigation. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. As far as parcel security, the material of the parcel is important. For shipped goods, the most common material used and the most widely accepted is paper. Make sure it is packed sturdy enough with no rips or tears. We've definitely had packages rip open before due to haphazard packing. A more common problem, though, is the package labels. When an item does not make it to the right place, this is the most common reason. The label may not be in the right place or marked clearly enough. If you're receiving any items from abroad that must be declared, please remember our guidelines in order to ensure the timely delivery of your item. Make sure it is packed correctly, and we ask that you notify customs between 2 and 10 days within the item's scheduled arrival date. OK, before we move on, are there any questions? That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. to Section 3. Section 3. You're going to hear an explanation of how a school chancellor will be chosen. The chairman is explaining the process to two students, Sarah and Arnold. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good evening, everyone. I hope you've both taken a look at the documents given to you. As student members of the University Chancellor Selection Committee, you will help to select a new chancellor for our university. This person will be responsible for the operations, academics and budget of the university. Today, I want us to talk about getting feedback from other students and about the selection process. OK, so what exactly will our roles be? You both are four members of the committee representing the interests of the student body. When we go with the applicants for Chancellor, your votes will count the same as other committee members. The same as other faculty and administrators? OK. Indeed. It is important to have student input in the selection process. That will be part of your duties as committee members, to talk to the student body and get a feeling for what they want in a new Chancellor. You will report back to me, the committee chairman, and then talk to the rest of the committee. I suggest that you contact the student newspaper and ask them to do some sort of survey. You both can also talk to the heads of various student organisations and gauge their opinions. All right. What sort of questions should we ask? Well, if you know of any issues important to the student body as a whole, you can ask them about that. I know that there was a recent increase in student fees. Since the Chancellor is in charge of the budget process, he or she will certainly be involved with that. But that is one topic that everyone can be asked about. A question about financial issues? OK. You also mentioned going to different student groups. I was wondering, would that be appropriate? If the Chancellor is the head of the whole university, is it that important to ask the opinions of a smaller individual organisation? Definitely. 
They may be smaller organizations, but they often represent a wide number of students. It would be in the best interest of the school to have a chancellor that understands the needs of not just the community as a whole, but of the different parts that make up that whole. I see. I guess it would be best to contact the leadership group of each club and group? Yes. Actually, that would probably be the most efficient way to get their opinion. Before you hear the rest of the explanation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. After you get a feel for what the student body thinks, I would like you to create a report for me. As chairman, I am responsible for making sure the different views of the students, faculty and the administration are heard. So what happens after we submit our report to the rest of the committee? We'll start with the rest of the selection procedures. We have an open process, meaning anyone who wants to can apply to be chancellor. That way, we will have the widest available pool to choose from. Of course, the first step will be to narrow down the field of applicants. Looking at their background and work experience, we will end up with 15 candidates. There will be further background checks on the remaining candidates. These checks include talking to the references a candidate has listed, as well as asking about them at any previous institution they may have worked at. This is quite a rigorous process, isn't it? It has to be. The Chancellor represents the university, so we need the best qualified person. After the background checks, we will contact candidates and ask them to come in for an interview before the committee. I remember hearing that we'll also be sitting in on those interviews. It'll be difficult to think of good questions to ask all those candidates. Well, I think the committee as a whole will do that. Ah, uh, OK. That sounds like the best way. Yes, it's quite a rigorous interview process. Each candidate will have to come in a second time. The final five candidates will then be asked to come in a third time and actually interact with some of the community members here. After the committee chooses the finalist, that one name will be sent to the Board of Trustees to be approved. They will also go over the candidate's material before having an up or down vote on him or her. Then that person becomes the Chancellor of the University? It is good to have so many people working together on this. I'm sure we'll find a great Chancellor. Yes. Actually, there are many interesting stories about past selection committees. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You'll hear a talk on the subject of the urban landscape. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I have been asked today to talk to you about the urban landscape. There are two major areas that I will focus on in my talk. How vegetation can have a significant effect on urban climate and how we can better plan our cities using trees to provide a more comfortable environment for us to live in. Trees can have a significant impact on our cities. They can make a city as a whole a bit less windy, or a bit more windy if that's what you want. They can make it a bit cooler if it's a hot summer day in an Australian city, or they can make it a bit more humid if it's a dry inland city. On the local scale, that is in particular areas within the city, 
trees can make the local area more shady, cooler, more humid and much less windy. In fact, trees, and planting of various kinds, can be used to make city streets actually less dangerous in particular areas. How do trees do all that, you ask? Well, the main difference between a tree and a building is a tree has got an internal mechanism to keep the temperature regulated. It evaporates water through its leaves, and that means that the temperature of the leaves is never very far from our own body temperature. The temperature of a building surface on a hot sunny day can easily be 20 degrees more than our temperature. Trees, on the other hand, remain cooler than buildings because they sweat. This means that they can humidify the air and cool it, a property which can be exploited to improve the local climate. Trees can also help break the force of winds. The reason that high buildings make it windier at ground level is that as the wind goes higher and higher, it goes faster and faster. When the wind hits the building, it has to go somewhere. Some of it goes over the top, and some goes around the sides of the building, forcing those high-level winds down to ground level. That doesn't happen when you have trees. Trees filter the wind and considerably reduce it, preventing those very large, strong gusts that you so often find around tall buildings. Another problem in built-up areas is that traffic noise is intensified by tall buildings. By planting a belt of trees at the side of the road, you can make things a little quieter, but much of the vehicle noise still goes through the trees. Trees can also help reduce the amount of noise in the surroundings, although the effect is not as large as people like to think. Low-frequency noise in particular just goes through the trees as though they aren't there. Although trees can significantly improve the local climate, they do, however, take up a lot of space. There are root systems to consider, and branches blocking windows and so on. It may therefore be difficult to fit trees into the local landscape. There is not a great deal you can do if you have what we call a street canyon, a whole set of high-rises enclosed in a narrow street. Trees need water to grow. They also need some sunlight to grow, and you need room to put them. If you have the chance of knocking buildings down and replacing them, then suddenly you can start looking at different ways to design the streets and to introduce tree planting. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answer.